We've been going through the book of Acts. We decided to go through the book of Acts because it's super important to us here at Vintage that you become disciples of Jesus. Uh, we are not here to create something like a friendship club where you can come and hang out. And I wonder what Pastor Pat will say. Uh, our point, our purpose is to train you, teach you, give you a good theology and understanding of who God is and what he expects from you so that when you go into the world, then you can talk to people about your faith and what it means to be a follower of Christ. So if you've never been with us before at Vintage, uh, you then are getting ready to embark on one of those type messages where we're going to talk about Jesus a lot uh, because we want you to be like Jesus. It all hinges on that. It hangs on that. We decided then to go through the book of Acts because we went through the book of Luke, and Luke and Acts are a two-volume set. Uh, Luke deals with the life of Jesus, his birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, uh, and then Acts picks up when he ascends into heaven and tells people to go into the world and establish the church, and so it's called the Acts of the Apostles, and we've been going through that. This week, we're going to be chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, dealing with the conversion of Saul, or Paul depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, this is what I have uh, come to while reading and studying and looking at this. This really more is a tale of two men and um, trusting God. And it's an interesting place because these two men come to God from completely different places. Saul is uh, vehemently opposed to Jesus, vehemently opposed to Christianity. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the stoning of Stephen and it told us that Saul was there um, and was approval of that, was happy about what they were doing. And so he is going to approach Christ then in his conversion from a place of skepticism and fear uh, and worry. And then you have this other guy named Ananias who we will see as we read this and look at this that God is going to tell to do some stuff uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of Ananias' life. But he does it. So it's an interesting then approach as we look at this this morning, to see uh, how then we approach God as from the place of unbelief and the place of belief. Or it could be from the place of if we are the church, right, if we are the representation of Christ in the world, then uh, that means to be a representation to something, you have to have somebody you're representing to. God did not create us and put us here and give us a church to be a part of to be inwardly focused and create like a country club experience where we can just hide in our bubble away from the evil world. There has to be a target for the truth that he has given to us. And that target then has to have thoughts and processes and ideas that make them who they are and philosophy about how they approach and look at the world. And you see that in this morning as we look at Saul and Ananias. So jumping in then to those verses, if you look here in... Uh, Chapter 9, verse 1, says that Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. Which is scary to think about what he is doing. So at the beginning of this uh, title, The Conversion of Saul, you don't really have like Saul, you know, woke up. And he felt bad about himself, and he thought, there's got to be more to life, and i got to make better choices and better decisions. I need to find a church to be a part of, get my garbage together, and then, I'm, you know, I'm on this search trying to figure it out. On the other hand, what you have is what? Saul has already established why he's right, and everybody else is wrong. I'm right, you're all wrong, and I know this to be true, because how I view God, and what I think God should be, and how I think God should work is this way, and anybody who opposes that is going to face my wrath. They're going to have to deal with me. And so he has gone into the leadership, the people who have the same ideas that he has, and he's asked for permission to arrest anybody who is a part of the way. It's the first time in the scripture that Christians are referred to as the way. Uh, it's the way of Christ is the implication. So I'm looking for people who have denied Judaism and are following the ways of Jesus. And if I find them, I'm going to bind them up Drag them back to Jerusalem. Now, in context, let's really think about what is being said here. Because sometimes we blow past it. Damascus, where he is headed, is six days walk from Jerusalem. You have to really be frustrated and hate some people to say, I'm going to go on a foot walk for six days out into the desert looking for people who believe something I don't believe 
And if I find them, I'm gonna tie ropes around them. I'm not gonna beat them, I'm not gonna hurt them there. I'm gonna drag them all the way back to, like make them walk all the way back to Jerusalem so that we can have a conversation about why they're wrong and I'm right. That is some deep-seated frustration and anger towards people. Really, when you look at this and you study this, what starts to ring true is Saul is really angry. He's angry. You ever notice with people that whenever they are anti-church, anti-religion, anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-all these things associated with Christianity, sometimes they're so angry. Like, why are you so angry? So this morning, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to try to help you here run through a whole lot of philosophy really, really fast. And if you're going to get bored, I apologize. But I feel like it's important if we're going to talk about how do unbelievers end up where unbelievers end up. And if that's our target and that's who we're supposed to convey the cross to and who Christ is, don't you want to know what they're thinking and why they're thinking? Or at least the influences on their thinking so that you can better communicate the hope of Jesus to them. So basically what happens is this. We go and we look at an unbeliever. We look at somebody who uh, in this world is like Saul, has come to their own conclusions and think they're right and you're wrong. What has happened is this. This is where the vast majority of people end up in our world. You first deny God, right? That's called naturalism. That's science. That's that modern idea that we're all machines. We don't have any say over how we're going to behave or how we're going to act. We're just... We're just responding to internal impulses. We have no control over it. Now, it's important that we recognize that you were created to be in a relationship with God. So deep inside of your soul is this longing to have a relationship with the God who created you. That's why so many people wonder what's out there, right? It's that old annoying YouTube song. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Well, why are you looking? Like, what is it inside of people and inside of, and it's all people. From the most skeptical, most cynical, most atheistic, I don't believe in anything, all the way over to the hooty doody spiritual new age, just want to stand out on the mountains and talk to the aliens. Across the board, there seems to be this inner desire to try to figure out, what's it all mean? Why are we here? What's my purpose? Why can I think? Why do I feel like this is bad and that's not bad? Where does that come from? There has to be more to life than this. Right, because way back in human history, we decided we didn't need God. So the answers to the questions are found in your creator, but if we deny the creator, then what are we supposed to believe? So then what you see is if you go through philosophy and human history, we've systematically tried to find other things to replace God. So first, we put us in that place. Mankind, we are the measure of what is good, what is right. We can figure it out. We can be the measure of all things. Man, if left to their own devices, will create utopian societies because we can reason, we can think. It's just modernism. But what happened? Well, the Holocaust. World War II. Uh, if you don't know, it's kind of a dark time in human history. Uh, there was this guy, Adolf Hitler. He killed a lot of people and hid it from the world. Uh, and then... Uh, you keep going, and they do, we just keep killing people. And what you see is there's this human condition inside of humanity that just as much as the idea that we should love and that we should care and this intrinsic value of human life that seems to be built into us, we don't know where it comes from. There's also this other side of human creation and human existence where we have this craving for power and for authority, and we're willing to hurt and do whatever we have to do to achieve that, and we'll set up systems that crush people and keep people down and we're selfish and self-minded. And so that idea that humanity will figure it out failed and fell completely short. And so then what happened was you get poor World War II and you get a bunch of hippie weirdos, right? The truth is out there. You know what we should worship? Experience. Just experience the world. You don't have to find truth. You just have to be. Just go and experience it. Take psychedelic drugs and experience whatever you can experience in the sexual world and just do and be and live and it feels good, it's right, it can't be wrong. Just do whatever you want and this will make us happy. And you watch free love from the 60s give birth to angry, mad, militant, anti-government, anti-people in the 70s and the rise of nihilism that says all life is absurd. There's no point. So we've gone from we don't need God and we can be the measure of all things and we're just machines all the way to the point now that in history you can look back and say, man, we don't have any purpose. Life has no meaning, no reason. It just, we just wander. And it would be best to die. It's 
subversive atheism. It's where you end up with Christopher Hutchinson saying that life is a meager, cold existence on a dead planet that cares not for you and the best we can hope for is death. <laughs> well, nobody wants to live that. Right? We didn't stop there. Like, most people are like, oh, Christopher, you got real dark real fast. And we went back, which was the rise then of postmodernism. What if what's true is whatever we say? Words create reality. Words create hope. We can say and believe whatever we want. Your truth, my truth, it's all truth. There is no truth. Just believe and do whatever feels good and feels right. And don't get anybody else's business. And if you're not hurting anybody, it's okay. And we'll all just tolerate our own uh, random beliefs we've come up with. Except there's no answer still for why do we have that thing in us? Why, are, why do you feel disconnected? Why do you feel separated? Why do you feel empty? Why do you, when you achieve, why do you feel like there, there should be more? Like I need, I, why is there this consumption thing inside of like, I need to have an experience more. And if I had this and I'd be happier, if I had that, where does that come from? Even in the idea that we create our own realities and our own truth with our word, even inside of that, there seems to be a failure of like, there needs to be more and it creates angry people because what happens? Well, you believe the way I believe in a postmodern system. So you have your belief and I have my belief and we were talking and we noticed our beliefs lined up. So you have your belief and I have my belief and my belief and your belief is very similar. But our belief is different from their belief. So now we're going to make a club of belief. We've all come up with our own beliefs, but somehow our belief that you came up with, that my belief I came up with on our own, they've created a, a symbiotic belief where now we've created a club or a tribe. And our tribe is at war with your tribe. And our tribe is at war with your tribe because you're saying your truth is more true than my truth. And so I'm willing to die for it because I believe in my truth. Well, wait, this doesn't line up with postmodernism that we should all just tolerate each other and believe what we want. You can believe what you want, and I'll believe what I want. Now we're, we're angry? We're mad again? Why do we always get angry? Why are we always mad? Because we've separated ourselves from the one thing that can give us the answer. The one thing that can fix the problem, the one thing that can fill the hole, the one thing that will philosophically answer why you're here, why you exist, why you believe, why you are who you are, all comes from knowing the Creator who made you. But if you separate yourself, from that, then you end up tribal and angry, like Saul. This is pure tribalism when you read about him and you look at him. He's gone back to his people. He's gone back to his tribe. He said, I want to go find people who aren't like my tribe. I want to hunt them down. I'm going to tie them up, and I'm going to bring them back here, and we're going to deal with this problem. If we can just deal with these people who believe differently than we do, then we won't have to deal with this anymore, and we can set people right. If people would just be liberal, then we wouldn't have to deal with it. If people would just be conservative, then we wouldn't have to deal with it. Don't vote for them. Don't look at them. At the end of the day, though, Christ created all of us with purpose and design. And as we study Saul and we look at this morning, you don't see a God who wants to attack him for his tribalism. Instead, you see a God who sees his value and worth and has a purpose for him even before Saul's converted. Which means, then, we have to stop seeing people as their tribe starts in people who are lost, been forsaken by humanistic philosophies that have led us down a dark path to a place of uh, absolute nihilism. Postmodernism is nothing more than nihilism with icing on it. We just put it in it look like a cake and then it's easier to swallow when we say life is absurd. We need to know who God is. We need to have an experience with him. We need to have the moment that Saul has when he gets knocked off his donkey. Verse 3 says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, Well, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now rise and enter the city and be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. 
So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now I don't know about you, but if you grew up in church, everybody wants to talk about Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. But if you read that, there's no conversion there. What happens? God slapped him off his donkey. And he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, let's paint, imagine this picture. This is Saul's conversion. He preaches, he taught this. Church history records this is what we believe. We know something happens because if you don't know, Saul becomes Paul and writes a lot of the New Testament. He founds churches all over the place. He is the pastor to Gentiles. He goes, I mean, he does all kinds of crazy stuff. But at this moment, he's an angry Jew who is mad that the Christians are saying that the God you think you've created is not who the real God is, and the real God is Jesus. And he's so angry, he's gotten a team of people to go find those people and tie them up. Now, if you're in that group, right? This is our tribe. We're right. They're wrong. We're going to get it. And you're walking along, and then boop, the light turns on on your leader. Uh-oh. Then he falls off the donkey. Then you hear, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what does Saul say? Who are you, Lord. Who are you? Jewish tradition at the time said God has stopped talking to people. The prophets have gone silent. Yet God is speaking directly to Saul. And he says, who are you, Lord? And that Lord is, who are you, Yahweh? Who are you? This, this famous word for the name of God that was so revered he didn't say it. And yet Paul yells it out in the middle of the desert, laying on the ground. Who are you, Lord? Now let's, let's just remember here. Saul had created who he thought God was. So much so that he was willing to put people to death who said God was not what he said God was. This is the nature of unbelief is to lead you into isolation and to lead you into callousness and to lead you into a place that you can't listen or hear the real truth that God is living and breathing and wants to know you. But at the end of the day, if we're really honest with ourselves, when you experience the real God, unbelievers will go, who are you? And how does it respond with, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting? There's people all the time when they're like, well, I love Jesus, he was great, I love him so much, but he, you know, he never claimed to be God, and he never, and that was all his followers later. Well, here's Acts, and here's Jesus, saying to Saul, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Yahweh? I am Jesus. I am God. And what does Saul do? Freaks out. Well, why? Well, because if you believe God is knowable, if you believe God is out there, and if you have come to the decision that it could never be Jesus, but then Jesus reveals himself to you that you are God, you can see why there might be some issues that you have to walk through. See, Saul is what we call an oppressor, and in today's world... That's not a good place to be. In fact, I would argue with you that the real hang of Christianity, if people were really true to themselves and really thought about it, is that uh, the fact there's redemption for oppressors is really hard to swallow. So you mean I can be a terrible person and I can do terrible things and I can hurt people and run people over and God's still going to love me and forgive me? How is that a good and loving God? Are you telling me that Adolf Hitler could have done the things he did, he could have said the things he said, and if Adolf would have had some sort of moment where he... Repented that God would love him? Absolutely. And if you don't like that, let's go back to our original discussion of you were created to have a relationship with God. And God existed before you existed, and he determines who and how he's going to be. And his character is bigger than what you think. And so instead of you getting mad and frustrated, you should have a, try to have an understanding of who are you, Lord? What's interesting about Saul, and what's interesting when you look at this, is that this man, who uh, was not doing what he should have been, that when God revealed him to him, his first question to that God is not, why do bad things happen to good people? It's not, how did this happen? Did you create this? How long have you existed? Where did you come from? All of the things we struggle with. What's his question? Who are you? How do I know you? How do I have a relationship with you? How do I, what do I, what have I done? switch gears. And we go from that to Saul blind in darkness sitting in Damascus licking his wounds trying to figure out how did I end up here? 
what have I done waiting? You ever get in trouble in high school, junior high, elementary school? I did, all of them. <laughs> you know, worst experience? That walk from your room to the office, and you have to walk in, and then we had Miss Judy with our secretary, and now you walk in. What are you doing here, Mr. Edgerton? Uh, I got kicked out of math class um, because I was making farting noises. And uh, every time uh, Ms. Simpson would say, who's making farting noises, I would yell, you all. <laughs> and she told me that if I did it again, I was going to have to go to the office. And then I told her that Mr. Jennings um, said I can't come to the office anymore because he doesn't want to see me down here. But she did not like that. <laughs> And then Ms. Judy would always look down at her desk, which I know now because I run into the woman because she didn't want to see that she was laughing. <laughs> and she would say, you need to make better choices, Mr. Arrington. Have a seat. And then the worst feeling of your life, there's no audience anymore. There's nobody to entertain. There's nobody to make laugh. It's just you awaiting your execution. While Mr. Jennings does whatever he's doing in that office, and you just gotta sit there and wait. Now, if you're Saul, and you've persecuted people to the place of death, and you vehemently argue that there is no need for Christ and there is no truth that Jesus was the Messiah, and anybody who believes that should be killed, and then that Jesus knocks you off the donkey, makes you blind, and tells you to go sit in the city and wait, do you know how excruciating those days must have been for him? Like, some people want to talk about the conversion of Saul, like it was some. Oh, he probably was just praying. No, he was freaking out. Enter Ananias. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. That disciple is an interesting word because it uh, is... <laughs> It's a way of saying that Ananias is not important. He's not a pastor. He's not a preacher. He's not an elder. Not an overseer. Not an apostle. Just a regular old layperson. One of you. Now, he's sitting there, and he has this vision. And the Lord says his name, and how does he respond? Here I am, Lord. Not who are you, Lord. Here I am. A believer knows the voice of God. So this guy, even though he's a nobody, he knows the voice of God. So when God says to him, Ananias, he goes, yep, what's up, Dad? Here I am. You move on. The Lord said to him, rise, Go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So God gives him very specific instructions, where to go, who you're looking for, very creative street names here, Straight. But Ananias answered, Lord... I have heard from many about this man and how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. Here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias, hanging out, God says his name. Here I am, Lord. Hey, do you remember Saul of Tarsus? The guy that's been killing all of you? He's got this hit squad of men, goons. They're coming to Damascus. Remember that story you heard on the street? Well, I knocked him off his donkey. He's sitting in the house of Damascus, and he's waiting on you to come lay hands on a crate for him. So I'm going to need you to go down there. Isn't it funny, Ananias' response? He doesn't say no. He's like a smart kid. Okay, God. But you do know. 
You have her. This guy has the authority to lock me up and throw the key away, and that's the best I can hope for. And what does God say? He's my chosen instrument. Now remember, there's no conversion on the road. At this point, Saul is a blind sinner sitting in a city trying to figure out what God's going to do to him for the dumb things he's done. And on the other side of it, God already knows. He's my chosen instrument. Which brings me to this this morning. There are a lot of people in this world who wander away from a God, who forsake God, who say they don't believe in God, who run down all these philosophical paths trying to find some way to replace God. God, and meanwhile, God stands behind them, never stopping chasing, never stop pursuing, knowing full well that person is my chosen instrument. I'm going to use that person. Which means, then, if we're Ananias, and if we're that person, it's super important that we recognize Saul is not the oppressor. Saul is the one we are called to reach because you don't know who and how God is going to use people. Saul writes tons of the New Testament. He establishes churches everywhere. He constantly does what God calls him to do, posts this story. What if Ananias would have said, I don't really like him. I don't really want to be around that guy. Do you know what he did? Do you know who he was? We don't get to dictate to God who God decides are going to serve him. And we don't get to dictate to God what that service looks like. Let us not forget, Paul will be executed for his belief. This is church history records. It's not like him becoming a follower of Christ is some big win. Yeah, yeah you're going to be famous 2,000 years from now. You're going to die a pauper death and be, you know, murdered, but wait till way down in history they're going to talk about you in the church on a Sunday morning. It's going to be great. He's going to suffer for his belief. He's going to suffer both in what he did, the weight that you bear on your shoulders when you're an oppressor and you have to constantly remind yourself that God loves you in spite of the failings that you've made. It's why we do communion on Sunday morning. That never goes away. This thing inside of who you are. It's why I relate to Saul. We all have those things that we look back in our past and go, I wish I could have that one back. There's this burden that you carry and it's what the enemy wants to remind you of. He wants to lead you into a place of isolation that you can't get past what you did. But at the end of the day, you are his chosen instrument. So, Ananias departs, enters the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came and sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized and taking food and he was strengthened. His conversion doesn't happen until the community Includes him. Until Ananias is faithful past, here I am, Lord. Until he's faithful to the point of, I'll go where you call me to go and I'll do what you tell me to do. If you want me to go lay hands on a murderer, then let's do it. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. This whole thing hangs on the idea that Jesus is God. When Saul says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Why is he persecuting? He's persecuting because Jesus came to earth fully God, fully man, died and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. And Judaism at the time didn't want that. They wanted us to be able to save ourselves, which we can't. And so now in the midst of all that, there's truth that rings out and says the hope that you have and the hope that we cling to is Jesus. So you're one of two people. You're Saul, you're Ananias. Who are you, Lord? Or here I am. There's no middle. You can't be in the middle. John writes in Revelation that if you're in the middle, you make God one vomit. Pick a lane. Be who you're going to be and stand firm on it. So much of this world wants to tell you that truth is subjective. We can just wander and we can just kind of figure it out as we go. Look around. Society does not work under that guise. 
It creates tribalism where people are willing to die for beliefs they made up. It's all arbitrary opinion. My opinion is better than your opinion and I'm willing to die for it. The resurrection of Jesus is not opinion. He did that. Whether you like it or not, it happened. How can you be so sure? I am so sure. If you want to have a conversation, find me and I'll tell you why I'm so sure. We've talked about it a hundred times. The fact that we're here is a big argument. We're talking about it this week. We're talking about it. This persecution, this early church that they tried to squash over and over and over for 200 years, feeding them to lions, and killing them, crushing them, trying to do away with them, and yet here we sit. Because something happened. And so this morning, you can be like Ananias. The beautiful thing is that Saul becomes like Ananias. Saul goes from being humbled from this great Jewish leader where he's spouting how dry I've studied under Gamaliel and I know all and see all and I have my own kings and we're going to to becoming just another disciple. To writing the words where he says we don't follow Paul, we don't follow Apollos, we follow Jesus. It's his church. And we go where he tells us to go and we say what he tells us to say and he leads us because he died and resurrected for sin. I persecuted people. I killed people who believed differently than that. And I bear the weight of that every day. And in the midst of that, he looked at me and said, you're my chosen instrument. He chose to use me in spite of my brokenness. He chose to take that which the enemy set to set me away from him, to use that to draw me close to him. And so this morning, if you feel like you're lost in darkness, you aren't. God doesn't not know where you are. In fact, I would argue the farther you get away, the more he knows where you are shepherd looking for his lost sheep. For the rest of us, we're the hands and feet of Christ. We've talked about it a lot, but Christianity is not about individualism. It's not about you figuring out your own way and having a 12-step program to be a better person. Christianity is about you putting to death your individualism and subjecting yourself to a community. And saying collectively, together, we will be the representation of Jesus in this world. Meaning that we all will say, here I am, Lord, where you want me to go. What do you want me to do? And we're not willing to say somebody's not good enough or somebody's not going to measure up or we can't use that person or you can't do this or you can't say that or you can't because God decides who his chosen instruments are. And so for us this morning, if you're struggling with guilt over your past and the things you've done and you think God doesn't love you or you don't think there's a road back or you think religion has failed you, it has not. And there is no road in hell that you can't turn around and walk right back out and come face to face with the God who created and loves you. Because you are his chosen instrument. For the rest of us, just be open to say, here I am, Lord. Because that's who we're going to be at the end. We're going to be the here I am church. When God speaks, we're going to go, here I am, Lord. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? That's who we're going to be. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning, and I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of Saul's failings and Saul's separation from you and his own arrogance and his own vehemence that he was right, you saw fit to see what his potential was. That you were willing to forgive that you were willing to use in spite of the things he had done wrong. Lord, we thank you that this faith and this religion, this thing that we call Christianity is based solely around grace and mercy. Lord, we thank you that you shed your blood, that you broke your body so that we could be set free from sin. Lord, for those who are believers in this room, I pray you would give them visions and you would speak to them, that you would give them opportunity to hear you say their name. So that they can respond, here I am, Lord. Lord, use us to go into this world. Into the broken places, the lost places, the dark places. The home of the oppressor. God, use us to be a light in this broken world. Use us as a healing balm for those who have been affected by that which is broken. Lord, I pray you would draw the sinner back to you. And then, Lord, I pray this community would be binded together as brothers and sisters in Christ and your spirit might move through the midst of it. Let this be a place of healing and 
reconciliation. Lord, send us your chosen instruments. It's in your gracious name we pray. Amen.